Hey everybody, Stu Smith and Jeff Nichols are back with another tactical fitness report. This time we're going to talk about becoming fatigue resistance or what is resistance from fatigue, right? So first of all, Jeff, th th thanks for uh, uh, doing this topic with me because I, I tend to get it a lot. You know, when people ask me about how do you train for this selection and this long endurance race, you know, what, what is going on with the human body that just keeps you going and able to finish a day that turns into the night, you know, and be physically moving all the time. So that's kind of my definition of what fatigue resistance is. Um, you know, what, what about your, you know, what do you think? And then we'll, we'll go to Google and see what Google thinks. Right. Yeah. I think for me, like, I guess it, I think as a coach or whatever you say, like when a question gets asked, my brain goes to a place. I don't know why. I think it's a matter of how I've learned the teachers of how do I solve problems. And so when someone's like fatigue resistance, my brain goes to, you know, it's like, what are we trying to develop, right? Whether it's sports specific in our realm, it's like, I think it's, it's like posture specific. I want to have really good tactical posture, like whether I'm running, has a very good athletic posture ideally right shooting a gun has a variety of that skydiving all these things all these varying postures hmm. because when i'm taking that posture of shooting skydiving or even selection it's also kind of assumed that i'm going to probably have to, i'm going to be asked to take that posture for a long time and so i'm going okay if my if my buddy's life depends on or i do or the training depends like i really need to hold posture so i can do this skill very well for a long period of time. That's what's expected of me. So I think resistance and that sort of thing is like, Hey, can I hold good athletic or tactical posture whenever I get hot, cold, but also when I get, you know, fatigued over a long period of time or the other side is like, Oh man, you, there's this acute load right now. Hold it. Ready, set, go. You know, and it's like, okay. So I, that's where my brain goes as long answer. Short question is like, for me is I need to have the ability to maintain high levels of accuracy when I'm really stressed out. No, that's, that's great. I like. No, I, I love that. Um, you know, and maintaining technique and maintaining your posture. I love that concept. Um, you know, my brain first went to, well, it depends. Right. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> obvious. That's true. That's so true right there. Yes. <laughs> depends on the athlete. And then I, I branched out into two different, ways and then that even had a couple of different branches but let me just read the i guess generic answer to it that i found on uh google so fatigue resistance is the ability to sustain continuous movement throughout the body even when faced with stress from heat metabolism or cardiovascular demand is also the proportion of maximal effort of an athlete can produce at the end of a long race or training day. Right. So put that guys, just put you put, put instead of sport, think of, okay, what, what are the, some of the long duration physical demands placed on our operators? Like think of maybe I'm on a gun or like any obstacle course, like soft sand is a constant adjustment of tension and strength and endurance so soft sand just by mechanism is that swimming like there's all these things that, so the answer for me i when i think is like holy moly like everything that's asked of us in the tactical space is this is a demonstration of strength and endurance i i think I, it's you know you see it in sport but like and it's not that it doesn't exist in baseball but there are times in which the ball is not in play or football and it's even in a training space in the seal community the ball is always at play <laughs> yeah. so it's kind of like that's the measure like posture is that that's what everything i when you're saying this i'm thinking that's the job yeah you know that's a really good point because you kind of have to find ways to rest even though you're not resting sitting still right so there's this form of active rest i like to implement into training cycles depending on the specific goal of course sometimes it's better to just completely rest in between like heavy lift sets um whereas you know if i'm doing calisthenics you know i can mix in a jog 
to kind of come back around and shake out my upper body before I do another upper body set or leg set. Um, I also tend to, depending on the activity, this is where my it it depends tree went um, was you know an upper body lower body type of re- yeah. fatigue resistance Agreed. because you know when you have loads over your head or on your head you know that is not only a shoulder girdle arm strength but it also goes right into the system of the core going from neck all the way down to the hips then it also involves the legs so i mean it is it is a load bearing durability but it is also a uh kind of a high mileage whether you're walking running load bearing rowing you know whatever that activity is endurance work capacity all blended in there so in, in the end it was really becoming a well-rounded athlete not having too much of one thing to the detriment of another you know and by assessing yourself figuring out where your strengths and weaknesses are you can start focusing on these weakness and get those weaknesses up to a higher level of almost strength compared to your natural strengths. And that in itself helps you become fatigue resistant. Yeah. Yeah. Like I, I think we could start this whole thing off by explaining like that fatigue resistance is not a linear achievement. It doesn't just more, it doesn't just equate, Hey, I'm going to do something longer each day, or I'm going to do something heavier each day. That's what I mean by linear. Linear means, Hey, it's always increasing in some, um, some numerical value, right? We do. That's a goal. We want to have that increase at the end of our training session, but every day you you don't want, you shouldn't expect it to be a continuum because if it is an actual continuum, there's one thing for sure that's happening is your load isn't enough. Just that's that's yeah. that. Like that's like going to the gym every single day and doing the same exercise and never getting sore. It's like okay, doesn't mean the exercises are bad, and it doesn't even mean you're not putting the time in. It just means that the effort, the focus, or like the the relationship you have with the activity isn't isn't there. And I, and so like here's kind of where I see the job even layer. Here's the depend side even more. Is okay. We say sport. Like think about how for many of us we practice sport really vigilantly. But what does practice look like in between the sessions of training? They're pretty benign. Guys are laughing, joking, moving around, whatever it might be. But then I think, okay, what does the rest period look like in between the run, the, the kill house runs? No one's screwing around. No one's doing this. Like there's a different point of focus to it. There's a different attitude entirely. And then you go, okay, let's take when I'm in a real world situation, clearing from room to room. And there's active shooter. What is my posture in between the points of where I'm actually taking it? It isn't, it's even further extreme. Okay. So, so the question is, is where am I really developing this new endurance? Because most guys that we train, it's not about having to have to push them and do harder. We got to pull them back to regulate, regulate their real effort in activity. But then it really becomes, oh wait, like I actually don't need to, get these guys to throttle back during the motion. I need to get them to just take a breath, focus and calm down in between them. Yeah. Love That's that. really what I'm training. So it's like, so my answer is my thought is this is like, question is like, well, how do I know I'm getting more endurance or more fatigue resistance? You, you look at their posture and their behavior during their rest periods. That that's how, you know, it's happening. If you're like end of set or end of sprint interval, and you're, you're chaotic or you're, I'm really tired and out of breath, but I have a process that I fall into. And so that, yeah. that if people are like, well, what's strength, endurance, all these sort of things. And I go, well, it can be measured. You just got to look at how they rest. Yeah. And time it. You know, so how, many, how long so does it take value. you to get, how long does it take you to get back to a relaxed state? You're talking that is eight, that is HRV. That is what yeah. heart rate variability is. It's how do you measure the time in which you get get back control of your nervous system, essentially. Oh, right? absolutely. This is absolutely to, to, central to nervous system focused. So how do we do that? You do it during your rest periods. You do it, you know, like this is the one thing I want to say, like 
just give people an insight what I'm talking about. You've experienced this, Stu. You and I have stood in our buds class day one, week one, 180 students, and we're 12 people deep on the pull-up bar, and everyone's freaking out. And you and I are standing there going, we go and do 10 pull-ups, we get down, we go to the back and go, why is everyone freaking out? I got 90 seconds of rest. <laughs> everyone's freaking out. And they're like, oh, that's the game. The game is when I'm on my gun in between the doors. Am I freaking out or am I displaying really good posture to the dude behind me that's got my butt? You know, like that's really – so we're, we're looking way down the road, but people always want to train the, the train the train the awesomeness. And, like, if you really want to be awesome, train what Stu and I are saying. Be aware of what you're doing, even this stuff that most people consider really unsexy. But this is where yeah. they act that. But yeah, I, yeah, I love that as well. Um, you know, there's another spectrum to this altogether, uh, and you can't have fatigue resistance if you don't have the right fuel in your body. Period. Right, and you know, you, you really do need, or I should say, if you want to end your spec op selection day quickly, right. <laughs> And that that is go in dehydrated, no electrolytes, and don't eat breakfast. I mean, because that will ruin your ability to just stay with the group, not bend over cramping from full body cramps. You know, it's that's the easy way to get out of a class is yeah. ignore your hydration and food going into your body. Because if you don't have the fuel, you don't have the ability to take it to that next level. But here's the deal. You got to do the same thing in your preparation so you can know just how much food you're going to need to be able to do this long workout of the day, you know, and, and what foods you eat after that. And, you know, because you're not just eating to work out you know, get energy for the next workout. You're eating and going to sleep to recover from the previous day's workout and eating to have some energy for tomorrow's workout stored in your body. Yeah. You know, so I, I would say if you needed a focus all of the time on something that makes you fatigue resistant, that is your food and hydration, period. Yeah, I would agree. All the time, John. Yeah. I would agree. I think number one and two are definitely, I, I, I put food and hydration before sleep merely because sleep, even when we're everything else is perfect and we want best our best sleep, we a lot of times don't get it. But when it comes down to food, we have a little bit more control over that. And there is a sense and there is a reality and there is a belief from my part, from experience that a little bit of, a little bit of sleep uh, deprivation with a really good diet, a really good fuel source leads to very little physical performance deprivation unless it's chronic. Right. Three, four, two, three, four days in a row of just not sleeping, you're never going to catch up with your food. But a day or two behind, and that, that's what you see in the workplace and things. So I just want to be, I, I totally agree with that. And I think that the second point that, again, I couldn't agree more, Stu, is that practicing this in training is most valuable because what you're saying is like you don't want to change your diet or change your footwear right before an important race it's no. like we want to go okay we also i've never been someone that can typically have a big meal go go for a big long run so what so knowing that i'm not successfully able to do that regularly well i got to find a way to at least consume some food hydrate for sure that i know i can maximally put out but not make me nauseous or throw up, right? Because that's the game. That's, that's yep. the game we play. So I agree, Stu, guys. Practice this. Find some fruit and simple hydrations that you can get the necessary calories to at least get through that event so then you can get to lunch and actually refuel because the most common reason why we see well-trained people have a real difficulty in selection is that they get behind on their food, right? Then they get sipe. And then it really, yep. like that dehydration leads to a real big respiratory issue that really, you lose your appetite and you lose your hydration. The next thing's going to happen is you're going to stop sleeping well. 
Yeah, it's, just, it's just a chronic thing. And so, so practice that. Know like, hey, you want to be a Navy SEAL? Your first two to three months, you're struggling with finding a diet, eating, training plan. Awesome. It's a good thing you're doing it then instead yep, of yep. right when you show to boot camp. Yeah. And find little, you know, easy things to add to your day, little snacks. You know, I, I used to grab an apple from the chow hall. I'd take little honey packets, peanut butter packets, you know, whatever it was, and just throw them in my locker. Yep. When I had a minute, when I was changing out for the next evolution or something, you know, yep. just suck those things fruit, down. Because fruit, nut yeah. butter, fruit, honey, nut butter. Like, if, it, if I had to do it all over again, I'd always have coconut oil, raw coconut oil on my shelf. I'd have raw peanut butter. I would definitely have uh, salt. I've had, I'd have like some yeah. sort of mineral, just regular salt, salt, not, not sodium salt, like real salt. Yeah. And I probably would always have fruit in there. Yeah water that's what i'd always have in my lockers just because i know that spectrum is really quickly consumed it's not going to give me any sort of uh, stomach disruptions and once i'm into training and my body consistently gets that nutrients it will learn how to use it as fuel and when you learn how to use the right full right food for fuel at home when you take those habits to north carolina san diego wherever you're going to go and you get into the buds or SF selection, your body knows to use those foods as fuel under stress because you've been practicing that. So when you show up to selection, not do you, not only do you not lose your appetite, you're getting the nutrients you need because it's familiar while your other people are losing their appetite and having struggles. So that's yep. why you practice it so you so you can be it, not hope to fend it off. Yeah, I love that. And that's the that's the fueling side, right? You can't go any further without the fueling side. That has to be optimal as best it can be. You, like you, I, I agree with you hundred percent sleep, you know, sleep is marginal at best, you know, when you're going through, you know, especially at buds selection program. So you can get some sleep, you get weekends off, you know, that's yeah. when you can play some catch up if you need to. Yeah. Once you get through hell week and some of those milestones, yeah. My experience and so many are the student, like, how good could you sleep post, post like some of those big evolutions? You're like, oh my God, hell week, I could sleep pretty good. When I got through pool comp, it was like, okay, sleep even improved. Island, I'm granted, there's not a lot of it at times, but God darn, I could sleep anywhere for like the first year out of buds, right? Like, oh yeah. It, it, deployments, yeah. deployment sleep and life sleep and things like that has its whole other conversation, but also got, keep in mind, Loss of sleep is an indicator of high stress. It might just be normal that that's happening for a couple of days. So you kind of go, okay, this is normal. Don't let that get the best of me. Make sure I keep my hydration and food up. And then you're able to, then you'll able to sleep. So that's, yeah. Stu is absolutely right. Yeah. When in doubt, when you get to selection, drink, drink, drink and eat, drink and eat good food. That's your best way to reset out of boot camp too. Drink and eat good food. Yeah, and something I that I would say the other side of the the story of this one is how you're training. Like, what are you doing to build resistance to fatigue? You know, especially when it comes to let's say you're preparing for running on the beach, rucking, carrying logs and boats. Okay, a very common worry that we all have all had going into it and many people have right now before they go um my advice on that is to you know build your running base is what's what you should to be and uh, you know there's debate on how many miles a week you need to do and you know I'm not really here to get into that but you don't need to go so high that you're just blowing it away and you're neglecting the durability side of that equation when it comes to strength and, you know, just stability. Um, but you also don't need to go so low where you're not, you know, addressing the endurance side of that equation. So, you know, somewhere, somewhere in the middle. Um, I've always done it this way with our guys is we try to make a variety of different running workouts, right? So we're focusing on hill day. So we're trying to make running a little bit harder by running up hills. We do a beach day when we're running on sand and getting used to that dynamic, you know, uh, surface. Um, we even go into the gym 
you know, and if you don't have a beach to run on, that's cool. You know, do it on a stair stepper. Put a weight vest and go on a stair stepper. I mean, that's a brutal one. Um, assault bikes, right? That's another good one that gets, I don't know what it does. I mean, the assault bike compared to a life cycle for me is just like, I feel like I'm a diabetic when I get off an assault bike. I mean, it is everything oh, yeah. working and, you know, it's, it's tough, you know, so you can make these things harder, you know, make, make an event like running harder by just adding just a little element, sleds, rucks, um, you know, just, all of those are ways to make running harder. And that is not something you do every day. This is a periodic thing. We, you know, when we talk about fuel and hydration, that's an everyday thing. This might be, you know, a once or twice a week event. And then you do some normal running or swimming or biking. Yeah, you know, as, as you know, Jeff, I'm I'm kind of like the triathlon approach to this training, where mm -hmm. instead of just long, slow distance running for days and building up your mileage up really high, you know, why don't you do like a triathlete would, and two thirds of your cardio is a non-impact day. Right. You got to swim. You got to swim anyway. You got to yep. run, but you know, what's that third option for you? You know, maybe pick another non-impact cardio that's going to be useful for you. Yep. Yeah. Like biking, rowing, stair stepper, whatever. Yeah. And that, I, like it's, it, again, we, we, you and I know how we work and that, and that's, that's like always, the, it, it, there's never an issue between that. Now the way, the way that we simply do it is like, be, because we, again, we, we, how do I say that? We let people in the door differently than you do. So that's the difference too, is like when, when we, when we, when we get these questions, we test them, right? Yep. Well, that's what we do. So that, so we're looking at their, their work output, their numbers, their spit, their, their size, all these sort of things that I look on the very mathematical strength coach side a little bit. So I look at that and I go, okay. And we, we do just like in the same sense as like if athlete X, when they should, when we see their splits and we're seeing where their splits, they're getting an anaerobic wall plus their sit-ups and all these numbers. We look at that and go, well, that's what your problem is. You're an anaerobic or aerobic deficit. It's really clear within the numbers. And we go, okay, so for this person, we would have them do, right? Yes. A, a low impact aerobic based or a mid impact because because they may have really good lungs, but if they're not able, like, able to exhibit strength, which isn't, I'm not, strength is posture posture yep. over time and so it's like if they can't even stop their body weight from doing something athletically we know they're lacking strength oh, so absolutely. we need to get them stronger numerically not and then there's ways to do that so it, it's because because people have to pass a test to train with us we don't have to it self filters if you will if that makes oh, sense sure. and, and i know your guys does too because what we're, what the other side is, we'll say it's probably safe to say, let's say out of a hundred athletes that come and train with either of us, out of a hundred, right? They all have about one of the one of the same five or six overtrained injuries, and they all came from one of about seven different sports or collection of it. So we get like carbon copies every course of about the same group of people, and you're yeah, like, okay. True. It's going to be a shoulder. It's going to be an elbow. It's going to be a knee. Someone's going to have shin splints. Someone's going to have this. And you're like, you ask the same questions. You're like, well, it's because of this, this, and this. And so the reality is, I think that when my answer to a long question is if you don't have someone to assess you, it, 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 it's a really simple, simple thing. If you want to be really good and really healthy and have really good fatigue resistance, don't eliminate anything. Don't eliminate long duration cardio. Don't like it has to at least be accomplished somehow. Like, yes. Cardio means heart. It doesn't mean running. So if, if I need to elevate my heart rate to elicit an aerobic adaptation, I can do it. A mil I can do it with bicep curls. If I want to persist <laughs> long enough to create that cardio. Now is that cardio yeah. bout going to align with i need some more durable legs strength resistant legs well not necessarily unless i begin to cycle my feet every time i curl and that becomes well why would i do that yeah and so so i think that there has to be an approach 
and if that if if the approach is well rounded, if we're addressing, you need to be strong. You need to have endurance. You need to have durability. You need to have some explosive durability, and you need to have some hypertrophy or be able to do something for a real long time with holding posture. Yeah, I love it. Yeah, but, and that that like our initial idea, what our initial question that you know when we were asked this question, that's exactly how it went. Mine split into well, it depends. Are your endurance athlete or are you a strength athlete yeah because that athletic history is going to really drive how you come back together and become a tactical athlete who is durable enough has some work capacity that you can lay off the you know the, you can put the fatigue down the road a little bit longer and there's another component to this is that you also have to be able to continue moving while fatigued, right? And what is that? Now we're dipping into a mental toughness side of fatigue, but it still comes back to your fuel. You know, yep. what energy system are you now using when you've burnt all the fuel in the tank and you still keep going, yep. you know? You still have a fuel system and you still have to engage this level of mental toughness because I will tell you, you know, pushing through fatigue is never pain free. Right. There, There is something that hurts along the way, whether it is structurally or cardiovascularly, something's going to be bothering you when you yep. push through fatigue. And then, and then for me, the other thing is the backside of that, like why are we doing reps and sets we are trying to challenge a posture that is the challenge it isn't how many bicep curls can i do how many times can i hold a posture in which i'm deciding to bend my elbows like that's that, that's what i don't understand also about a person's willingness to do ugly reps like mm. you are it, it, it really is this really like bad thing we need to change i, I it's the fa the fact that we've accepted we begin to say oh no it's just let's just just do them do as many as you can even if they're bad well that that you that's know, the big difference because we we get a lot of people that aren't don't have that athletic background they don't have like those people are aren't the endurance or the strength athlete they're neither and so their collection of adaptation is 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 different as well and yeah, where where is it well, there's only the, the the thing that I believe. I believe that where is it that we can test, evaluate, measure, and reproduce our most practice reps? It isn't going to be in the road and ain't going to be in the pool. It's going to be in a weight room. Now, yeah, if you, when you get good technique in a pool, then the pool becomes a place to do that. But only when your technique is good, because again, then we're just doing bad reps and bad swim, swim laps don't equate better swimming. Yep. Right. And so same with really, really, really bad gait doesn't el elicit better running. It eventually runs into bad he hips, knees and, and ankles that never elicits a good running. So yeah. technique is everything. You're you're only as good as your accuracy. Like because, again, I have two pistols. One, both of them got 15 rounds in it. Am I just going to close my eyes and pull the trigger and got 15 rounds is the same as if I aimed for 15? They're certainly not the same. And so oh, no. am I going to slop around and do my push-ups, or am I going to take an appropriate rest period so it is really hard because I've got to focus and hold posture? That's the test, not the yes. rest. Oh, I love it. In fact, you made a really good point there when you talked about um, you know, workouts being like one of the things you wish you could change. And I, and I think the biggest thing we need to change is timed workouts. Yeah. Right. I don't care how quickly you can do the Murph. I'd rather see you do the Murph with perfect reps perfect. That's every perfect. time. I In agree. Fact, pe people ask me all the time, like, how fast is your Murph? I'm like, I don't know. I don't time it. Yeah. Right. I, I just, just, no, I always I say I have, I, have too much, I have too much respect for for uh, Michael Murphy to do a sloppy workout. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's really true. You know, timed workouts are, I think, where you're right things fall apart. Technique falls apart. Stability falls apart. Um, fatigue is 
is part of that and working through fatigue, you might hit some mental toughness issues in there, but it doesn't do you any good if your technique starts to falter. Now your susceptibility to injury starts to increase and it just goes yeah. downhill from there. Maybe it needs to be said, Stu, this isn't a game. We're not talking about sport. No. We're talking about men who train to carry firearms to take and protect human life. So why is it that accuracy of the place that we can acquire the best adaptation under stress until we're in a stressful combat environment? Where Where is the place that we can best transition to stress stress acclimation? It's physical. It's the physical. That's why there's such a physical proponency placed on our, like, there, like, that's the thing is like, you, you experience it year after year of the, all the, all the young midshipmen coming in. What's one of the first things, get fit, get ready, get in order. Let's do this. Yeah. yeah. Like we've gotten so far away from that in some areas. And it's like the beginners of this don't, some of them are just like, wait, what do you mean? I got to pay this much attention. Like, you care, you're going to be carrying a gun for a living, man. Like this, it starts now. Yeah. Very good point. Um, yeah. So things that I do, let's just uh, maybe shift gears and talk about different styles of workouts. Um, you know, things I do, I, you know, for fatigue resistance is, um, you know, higher volume lifting, calisthenics, um, even weighted calisthenics to a degree, you know, pushing, pushing those reps. And there is a difference between fatigue and failure, right? So I like to push to fatigue, right? Maybe have one left in me, right? Unless, you know, I don't feel like pushing to failure and then that one coming down on my chest and sticking potential for injury right there, you know, all that, especially when you're that tired, you lose all your motor function, you know, so I try to push to fatigue, rest, and that rest can vary depending on your ability. That rest can vary as a nice slow jog, come back for a minute or two on the bike, it, or it can be a legit rest where you're just sitting in a chair trying to catch your breath, hydrating a little bit in between. Yeah. Um, but you will see your progression into fatigue resistance start to show itself when you don't need as much rest. Like yeah. for me, that's, that's kind of like that big assessment. Like you said, you're watching posture and breathing rhythms, you know, during the rest sets that that's huge. And your need for rest at all, you know, can, it can get to a point where you can do an entire workout and your rest is completely active rest. Like you never really stop moving in a hour long workout. Um, and it's, you're just constantly going. I think that is a great indicator that you are building that fatigue resistance that people are looking for. Right. And, and I, and again, it's like, then the other question is, is like, fatigue resistance for the selection student is very different for the operator and that's yes. what a thing too is like oh, that's a whole other night and day. okay okay like so who are we really talking about right because what you just mentioned it's like how much importance as a deselection student have they have they put on like i said rest periods now the operator is like hey my accuracy is really really good because i have all this training well, how do I keep my accuracy up? It's yeah. what those moments of micro rest in reality or transitional exercises in the gym, those need to be practiced. Cause like, if you watch like a shooting competition, yes, they're shooting in these bays, but watch what's happening in between the movements. They're not sloppy. There's, there is like choreographed movements in between the shooting stages. And it's like, we do that too. We actually have the shooting stages in between our sets with the guns. Nice with our athletes. And what we do too is we program at some point once they, after week two, we program their rest periods of like, kind of, this is what you should be doing and feeling. And they all have pulse, pulse oximeters so they can see it in real time. What their breathing is posture. We're having them take bad posture and see how the difference is. Then we show them what is good posture. Is it hands on your knees? Is it hands over your head? Like find out and you can see it in real time. 
Find out what yeah. your good posture is in real time and now practice it. Because if you're stressed out here and you know what posture to take because you've practiced it, whether it is whatever gives you comfort, and now you go to buds and do it, you know what's going to happen. You're going to calm down real quick compared to your peers. And so you could practice that too. But then again, it's are we practicing it just because we hope? No, we can measure this stuff in real time. Easy. Sure. So that's kind of the, the our approach is like, and then what you do is I don't have to use a measurement anymore because once I practice a number of breaths and I take maybe it's six in, six out, right? That's 12 seconds by my, by 48 seconds, I have four breaths and then my heart rate's down in four breaths. Now I don't have to count. I know I can do it in four, but if yeah. I'm really stressed out, I can do it in seven. Love so it. what am I really practicing? I'm practicing. I need this watch or is it, am I feeling it? And so we get the guys to practice that you can do it in the water is the easiest place to do it. It's called the mammalian reflex. So like once you train somebody to get that, elicit that response, <gasps> oh, remember, breathe. There Seven breaths off the wall, go. And so Love we it. Just time it. And but you gotta practice it. And 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 that's where human performance is at. Like we don't have to guess anymore. Um, and you like you see it all the time with your guys, the trained eye, you can see it as a coach all the time when it's happening. And so you can intervene. And that's why it's also good to be in our position. So we can help guide people because once, once they experience the way through with Stu and I, they just become mentors in the teams doing it right. Yeah. You know, it's a really good point you made there at the beginning of that um, about the difference between selection prep and operator prep. In fact, I, I break down tactical fitness in multiple phases and you can kind of equate them with levels of school. So like phase one of tactical fitness is you have to pass this fitness test in order to get accepted. That's kind of like elementary school. Yep. Okay. Then you got phase two and phase two of fitness is, you know, preparing specifically for that selection. Right. Those two look different from each other. Yep. Right. That's kind of like high school. Right. And then you have phase three, the operator, completely different process of maintaining your physical abilities, your ability to mitigate stress, your ability to, you know, think clearly and creatively and get through problems. You know, all of those things are part of the operator. I call that phase three that we'll call that college level. Right. And then you, you know, have the experience of another level of that, which we will call grad school phase four of tactical fitness has taken that level of ability and becoming a tier one asset. Right. So you, mm -hmm. all of those look different. Yeah. Right. And where I think a lot of the younger people get confused is, you know, they think they can prepare for buds just using PST prep mm -hmm. or they're using operator workouts to prepare themselves for selection. Right. Yeah. You, you see, yeah, I, so you. I totally agree. It, get, it gets all that. So you got to follow this system um, and build yourself up progressively through this journey. And now you will be back into a, a world if you're an operator, you will, you will be back in the student world of having to pass a fitness test and a selection to get through another level of training and being a tier one operator. So all of these things kind of do get intertwined, but at first they do not agree. Right? Totally. You got bo boom, boom, boom. There's a sp specific process for you to get to and through this type of training. And then the beauty of when you're an operator and moving within the ranks of the operator world. Now, like you mentioned, there's a human performance. Yep world there you have world-class trainers that you can get information and training ideas from uh, yep. it's it's a completely different world yeah yeah the act and, and that's and that's that's the like the way i equate it is that access of information is like the yankees can draw from wherever they have a minor league triple a double a single a a and low a rookie team it's like yep. they're all the yankees yep. but the access of information is not the same and, and it's not meant to be because they, they're feeders, they're feeders yeah. to the end state. And, and that, and that's, so the thing too, is like, what, what, what you get your point is like, 
I had a, a kind of a, a look at the end state of it and I'm trying to reverse engineer it. So it's still valuable for the person at the beginning. Yeah. Cause, cause at the end, cause you're right. Like foundationally, that's no different. Like I think a lot of people come into the teams and they have this vision of this operator who they're going to be emotionally, physically, but they forget they have to go through all these deselection courses before they get in the position to go, Oh, now I have access to all these choices. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Very good point. I totally agree. So I, I guess to wrap this up, Jeff, I, I would say this too. another important piece that we haven't really discussed is, you know, you can't do this and be an overtrained, under recoveried athlete, right? right? There are needs for deloads and weeks of reduced mileage and reduced reps and reduced weight, increase the movement, increase the focus on the posture and the flexibility and mobility. All of those things also need to be a part of your training and once again it, it's very kinesthetic you know you have to kind of feel like you know what i'm not 100 percent right now my recovery is not that great you know i'm burning my candle at both ends you know maybe i need to pull back and do a a week of deload which really just means some percentage you're going to pull back on your intensity levels just so your body can kind of catch up otherwise you know Overtrained athletes do not have fatigue resistance. Right. Right. Because they're, they're just, always tired. Yeah. They're just burned yep. out. Yeah. 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 I would say exactly. You, I think it's imperative and, and probably one of the best pieces of advice we can offer is that is gain, gain experience with a relationship or a feeling of the day that I just had off now I'm training today and like I can feel that I had yesterday off because I can feel the better training today. And once you get that relationship with, Oh, a training day off allows me to train harder. We start valuing our training day our off day a bit better and not just taking it off. We, yeah. I always tell people your off day should be a day that you pretend you're sick. Hmm. Cause whenever we're sick, people are like, Oh, up, up your vitamins, drink more vitamin. Like all these, like, well, that should be every off day. Yeah. <laughs> chicken noodle soup that's what i'm saying i just you know <laughs> metaphorical but it's true like i yeah. a lot of people are like oh you know i just don't eat as much in my non-training days and i don't take Ooh. my supplements and vitamins i'm like no like that's the day oh, you be. that's the day you should be so anyways feed I, a cold feed a cold always <laughs> yep feed your training do not starve it yeah so that's 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 the last piece of advice i've got yeah well, I, I can't think of anything else on this topic personally, Jeff, other no. than uh, if you want to learn more about what Jeff and I do, you can go to uh, performancefirstus.com, right? That's correct. Did I get it right? Okay. Uh, yeah, stusmithfitness.com over here. Um, yeah, and check out uh, some of the videos Jeff has up on YouTube. You also have a, a membership area. Yeah, that, well, actually, because uh, we're dissolving that, that's fine. Because they kind of like that was the point was always to try to get people on a membership and keep them like engaged in the programming that way. But we realized that we were actually limiting people's access to our programs by not just sharing the exercises. So that's a good point. I think yeah. my 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 beautiful wife and business manager kind of gets through to me and is like, okay, that makes way more sense. Because at the end of the day, like ultimately, it's yes, we want to run a business, but. I'd much rather have people access to good information, I guess. And that's, that, yeah. that, that's what YouTube's for, I guess. Yeah. Whatever. YouTube. I, I believe that. Blog posts and yeah, all that stuff. So, so yeah, I appreciate yeah. that. We'll do it again. We'll find a, find a topic and try to see if we can massage it into some sort of <laughs> robot reliable advice. Yeah. If you guys want to uh, send us a comment in the comment section and uh, you want to hear a topic, we'll try to get back on each other's schedule and, and do it for you. You bet. So. Appreciate it. Sir. All right, Jeff. Have a good day. You as well. Thanks. All right.